Welcome everyone to VITA's first Balance and Aging, How to Prevent Falls webinar. Uh, my name is Cynthia Ryan. I'm the Executive Director of the Vestibular Disorders Association. And I uh, want to welcome you all to uh, this webinar. I want to give you a few um, just logistical instructions first. Um, you are all in listen-only mode, uh, so no matter what noise is going on behind you, the rest of us can't hear it, which is a good thing, um, but it means that you can't ask questions easily. Uh, what we'll do at the end, if there's time for questions, is um, you can type your questions at any time into the questions box in your GoToMeeting taskbar, and if we don't get to all of the questions, we will try to uh, filter through some of those and respond to them later on via email. Um, and uh, if we do have questions at the end, you can raise your hand and, and I will try unmuting you uh, so that you can ask your questions. Um, we'll also have a couple of polls during the webinar, uh, and I hope that you will participate in those so that we can get some feedback uh, from everyone. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump on into this and uh, introduce Jordan Tucker, who is presenting the webinar today. Jordan, I'll hand it over to you. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for um, coming to uh, listen to my presentation. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are in the country um, or the world, um, or potentially good morning, I guess. I look forward to um, doing this presentation. This is my second one, uh, second webinar for Vestibular Disorders Association, and I really enjoy um, getting a chance to reach out to a larger audience that I wouldn't necessarily if I was just doing local presentations. So I hope you enjoy the presentation, get a little something out of it, and um, as Cynthia said, there'll be some time for questions um, hopefully at the end. So Cynthia, you can flip on to the next slide. So big disclaimer, I'm sure you've heard this a million times about tons of different things, but um, please know that this presentation is not intended um, nor implied to be medical advice. We are going to go over some medical type information. So um, you're responsible for what you do with this um, information. Please make sure if you're making um, any changes to a routine, and we'll talk about this a little bit more further too, please always talk to your physician or healthcare provider um, before starting any new treatment or discontinuing an existing treatment. We certainly don't want you um, harmed uh, by any changes you might be making um, if you choose to make those by yourself. So again, please make sure that um, talk to your physician. This is not uh, medical advice. I don't know your individual situations. This is more general advice. So a little bit about me, um, I have over nine years of experience um, in treating patients with um, neurological, neurological diagnoses, um, including a, a balance deficits was um, a big portion of my population um, the last several years. Um, I have um, several years experience with vestibular deficits and um, my last year or so in the clinic um, I was really focusing on concussion as that was a kind of up and coming um, diagnosis that we were seeing patients for. Um, I received my certificate of confidence, competence in vestibular rehabilitation in 2011. That's a course uh, taught down at Emory University um, taught by um, many of the big wigs in the vestibular rehab community. Um, it's a pretty intensive course. It's a great course. I learned a lot from it. Um, I have left the clinic for a short time, um, about a year ago, and I started working at Jefferson College of Health Sciences um, down in Roanoke, Virginia, lovely um, Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, I work as an assistant professor here, and I am the coordinator of clinical education, which means I um, help our students get out into the clinics and um, learn their hands-on um, things, and I'm part of the physical therapist assistant program um, down here and looking to get back in the clinic um, sometime soon. So our first poll that will help you um, participate in, um, and Cynthia will pull it up here for you to um, make your votes, is how many times have you fallen in the past year? So please um, choose one of the options, and we just kind of want to get a sense of um, what our audience is like right now. So go ahead and answer that. We'll give you a minute or so. And it'll just hit the uh, submit button down at the bottom once you selected your response. <clears throat> Jordan, I'm going to, I have uh, some responses coming in. So far, we have about 50% of the people um, on the call have not fallen in the past year. 20% okay. say they have fallen once or twice, and 25% say they have fallen three to five times. 5% 5 say they have fallen over six times. Okay. So we've got a um, variety of um, fallers out there, and hopefully those non-fallers stay non-fallers. So
So why do we even care about falls? Why are we doing this whole presentation? Um, a third of adults over 65 fall each year. And only um, statistics show us that only about half of those people that fall ever talk to their doctor about it. Um, of those third of the adults who fall, uh, three quarters will fall again within six months. So it's not typically just an isolated incidence. There's something causing these falls that we want to try to figure out. And um, sadly, falls are the leading cause of accidental death and injury in people over 65. So falls are a major issue, especially as you start to age or have a diagnosis that potentially puts you at a higher risk of falls. So falls are a big um, financial burden on our um, healthcare system and on your own pocket. The estimated costs, uh, medical costs of falls in 2012, which is the most um, recent data um, that's out there right now, was about $30 billion in the U.S. So that's a pretty substantial amount of um, money that could potentially not be um, uh, paid out if we can find ways to keep people from falling and getting injured with falls. Um, so when people do fall, 20 to 30 percent of those who fall will incur serious injuries, such as hip fractures. Um, so again, we have a fall, we have a major injury, such as a hip fracture, puts you in the hospital. Often that's going to require surgery, require extensive rehab afterwards. So that's all. If we can hopefully prevent a fall from happening, we can prevent that whole cost um, to you, to the healthcare system, as, all, um, as well as um, costs which we're going to talk about a little bit in your confidence and your overall health. And because of a fall, a lot of times seniors can then no longer live by themselves. So we may see that falls result in a loss of independence. So um, someone may fall and then they're concerned about living alone or doing things alone because they're worried about falling again or their family's worried about them falling again or because of this hip fracture, they just can't do things um, for a while that they could have done before. Uh, pain and suffering, no one likes uh, being injured or um, having to be in the hospital, a reduced quality of life. Again, we talked about this may in, uh, decrease your independence, um, so maybe you can't get out as much as you could anymore, and that can affect your quality of life. Uh, caregivers may have to assist you more. Um, we may see um, some geriatric syndromes um, setting in, um, and then also just a pre premature morbid morbidity, excuse me, and mortality. So again, we may see um, earlier deaths or earlier um, loss of independence, earlier um, admission into a nursing home, those kind of things because of falls. And we can also have um, kind of psychological uh, impacts such as anxiety, panic attacks, depression, agoraphobia, so being scared to go outside. Um, uh, severely suicidal thoughts potentially at kind of the, um, the far end of that. Again, all of this is, um, a lot of this is often in relation to the fact that falling is scary. Um, if someone has uh, injured themselves in a fall, they're often scared to get injured again. Um, falling um, is a loss of control. So all this can uh, make someone very anxious and depressed and if all of a sudden you're not doing the things you used to do before. So really seeking out that someone may need professional mental health support if um, these um, uh, emotional impacts have started to um, affect you or a loved one after um, even just one fall sometimes. All right, so let's talk a little bit about balance. So we're talking about falls, let's talk about a balance system. So maintaining our balance is a pretty complex um, uh, system and it requires balance of the system. So we get input into our body from our eyes, our muscles and our joints, and our vestibular or inner ear organs. So our brain is going to take in everything we see in the outside world and everything we feel. What do we, um, do we see that we're about to walk onto grass and now we need to change how we walk? What are our muscles feeling like? What do our feet feel on the ground? What are our inner ears sensing? So all of that's going on simultaneously, going up to our brain, and then our brain is helping to output what needs to happen to maintain steady balance. So any error in the system, um, some of this can be due to very normal aging or it can be due to um, a disease process, can cause a loss of balance or loss of stability, which then may eventually lead to a fall. So let's talk a little bit about our vestibular or inner ear system because it's a little bit a fairly complex system. Um, so you can see on the picture here, this is what our inner ear looks like. So you can see the ear canal. Our ear drum is labeled there nicely. And then there's a small piece of bone that separates our inner ear, what we think of as our inner ear vestibular system. So that's that purple piece on that inner ear that kind of looks like a coiled up snail there. 
them. And then coming out of that purple snail, um, you can see uh, two yellow um, strands. Those are nerves that are going to go eventually into the brain. So this whole inner ear system really fits on the tip of your finger. So it's a really tiny system that does a whole lot of things, um, and a lot of things can be wrong with it that cause balance. So it's amazing that something so small can cause so many issues. So um, we talked a little bit about our vestibular system includes the balance organs in our inner ear. That vestibular system communicates to the brain through the vestibular nerve. So we can have damage along the nerve. We can have damage on the vestibular system itself. And then the brain is going to take those signals from, the, from our vestibular system, so that little piece of that inner ear, from our eyes and from our feet, and that's going to help create our posture and balance like we were talking about. So it's normal to gradually and slowly lose a little bit of function of that vestibular system. Um, as I'm sure we all know, even um, just getting a few years older, you feel your body sometimes start to slow down a little bit, muscles get a little bit tighter, knees hurt a little bit more going up and down the stairs. Part of that normal aging process is that inner ear system slowly starts to not react as quickly um, to our balance losses. But because but if it happens slowly and gradually, um, the body can learn to adapt to that um, and compensate for that, which is a nice benefit of our um, moldable body. So what we often call this um, uh, error in the vestibular system is we call it vestibular dysfunction. So our vestibular system is not functioning the way it should. So as we talked about, this increases with age. Um, Again, hopefully the body can adapt if it's a slow, gradual progression, but it may be faster or for one reason or another, your brain and body may not be able to appropriately adapt. So we also see that vestibular dysfunction, um, there's higher rates in people that have cardiovascular risk factors. Um, this inner ear has a blood supply to it, so if you, um, if the rest of your body is effect, affected by a decreased blood supply, you may also see that in your inner ear. So people with heavy tobacco use, high blood pressure, or diabetes may have a higher risk of this vestibular dysfunction. And as you can see the statistic there, there's a 70% prevalence in people with diabetes of vestibular dysfunction. And we'll talk about some other um, uh, side effects of diabetes that also affect the balance system. So you sometimes can kind of get multiple errors in that balance system with diabetes. So how do you know if you might have a vestibular disorder? It's kind of a weird concept. Um, not many people um, hear about it. They maybe hear about something about their inner ear. Um, so some signs that maybe you're experiencing a vestibular disorder. Um, if you have kind of unexplained repeated falls without feeling dizzy, so really that system's just off and something's not right about it. Sometimes that can be the inner ear causing that. Um, feelings of unsteadiness or imbalance. So again, if you just don't feel as balanced as you used to, could be due to the vestibular system. Difficulty walking or gait ataxia. And ataxia just means uncoordinated. So you're um, just not as coordinated or as smooth as you feel like you should be or used to be. Um, if you lose your balance with head turns, so you're walking nicely down the grocery store, this is an example I give to my patients all the time, walking nicely down the grocery store and your neighbor sees you from down the aisle and yells your name, hey Joey, how you doing? And you turn quickly to look at your neighbor because that's what your brain does when they hear your, you hear your name and then you start to lose your balance or fall. Um, classic signs of vestibular disorders are complaints of dizziness, um, vertigo, so a room spinning sensation that starts when you change your head position. So often my patients will say rolling over in bed, looking up, leaning over, you get this kind of real severe room spinning sensation. Um, this one's a little bit um, more unknown um, to people, but difficulty with concentration or memory. And what can happen with a vestibular uh, disorder is if your balance system is not working the way it should, a lot more energy has to go into just keeping your balance and walking. So if all of a sudden you now have to walk and listen to someone trying to tell you about their day, you may not be able to pay attention to that. So it's often not necessarily a concentration or memory issue per se, it's the fact that your body and brain um, don't have enough energy to devote to your walking and your balance and not being dizzy and paying attention to where you're going and also listening to your daughter tell, her, uh, um, tell you about her day. Um, so going along with that, 
some people will feel this kind of mental fogginess and reduced cognitive stamina. So it's just things feel harder to think about. Um, you get tired easier. Um, it's going to all go along with that kind of vestibular system having to work over time. Um, if you have a fear of falling, that might be your body trying to tell you, you know what, we, you're not as steady as you used to be. Um, and, and the brain can pick that up sometimes. Um, and the last one on here is uh, blurred vision, wavy patterns, or the illusion of movement of objects known to be stationary um, if you're doing quick head motions. So class, and this is called oscillopsia. So general description of that is you're walking down the road, taking your dog for a walk, let's say, and you look at that stop sign in the distance, and you know that that stop sign is rooted into the ground. It shouldn't be moving. But boy, it looks like that stop sign is bouncing up and down. Um, that's kind of what we refer to as oscillopsia. oscillopsia. So things are moving that shouldn't be. You know they shouldn't be moving. If you're seeing that, again, might be a sign of a vestibular disorder. So dizziness. Let's talk about dizziness a little bit more because um, that's the most con common complaint to physicians from patients over um, 70 years old. So 45 to 50 percent of patients complaining of dizziness have some sort of vestibular dysfunction. So that inner ear is not working the way it should and that balance system is not working the way it should. Now the problem with dizziness as a symptom is that it's complicated. Um, there are multiple things that could lead to dizziness um, and dizziness itself from multiple reasons can lead to falls, which is why we care about it and want to address it. So it is important to discuss with your doctor if you're having dizziness and try to explain to that doctor, do you feel like you're spinning? Do you feel like you're floating? Do you feel like you're just, something's not right? People describe dizziness in multiple different ways, but do talk to your doctor if this is something you're experiencing. So our second question here is, first, do you experience dizziness? Um, and if you do, how frequently do you have your dizziness? So go ahead, um, complete that poll as you did your first one. Okay, Jordan, we've got we've got answers coming in and I'm going to give it just another moment to settle down before I close it and report to you the the results. It looks like it's steadying out there. I'm going to go ahead and and close the poll. We've got 14% they say of the people who are participating today say they don't experience dizziness. 41% say they experience dizziness occasionally. 18% say they experience dizziness frequently, and 27% say they experience dizziness constantly. Oh, wow. So certainly a lot of you out there sound like you're dealing with at least some form of dizziness. Um, and it's important to know, too, you can have falls without being dizzy. You can be dizzy and not fall. So there are, um, there's multiple different versions out there of what the body experiences. But certainly, especially for those, that, um, those of you that do have even occasional dizziness, make sure you're talking with your doctor um, and trying to figure out what that dizziness is coming from. In our next slide, we're going to kind of talk about all the different things that can cause dizziness, and there's, there's a lot. So our one we just talked about, vestibular disorders. Um, if something's going wrong in the brain, sometimes the eyes, um, the dizziness is a, the body's reaction to a mismatch of signals. So your brain is um, understanding one thing, your inner ears are think you're doing something else, your feet think you're doing something else, and that brain just doesn't quite know how to deal with it. So often that's where that dizziness comes from. Um, central nervous system disorders, um, so things like having had a stroke in the past, uh, multiple scler sclerosis, um, those can um, certainly lead to dizziness or maybe a side effect of that. Um, migraine episodes or sinus headaches, so people can have migraines that are um, what we call vestibular migraines, and instead of or in addition to getting what you think of the typical migraine headache, people may experience um, bouts of dizziness as part of their migraine pattern. Um, your blood pressure being too high or too low. Um, I'm sure many of you have that sensation when you stand up too quickly after laying down for a long time and you get a little woozy and you have to kind of steady out for a minute. That's often because that blood pressure is a little bit too low for that brief period of time. But if your blood pressure remains too high or too low, that can be a cause of kind of an underlying dizziness feeling. Um, many, many medications have a side effect of dizziness, so it's important to really talk to your doctor um, about side effects of the medications. Medications may have an interaction that cause dizziness, or polypharmacy is just multiple medications. Um, this is certainly a, um, 
a medical system right now where um, it's luckily lucky we've got a, medications for a lot of things um, and to treat a lot of ailments but sometimes um, you can get too many medications so again working with your doctor and looking at your medications um, interacting interaction of medications with alcohol so many medications you shouldn't be drinking with at the same time so making sure um, that you're not doing that if that's a, a guideline of your medication um, having fluctuations in your blood sugar uh, being dehydrated um, not eating enough and that may be causing an imbalance in your electrolytes having an irregular heart rhythm um, low oxygen levels such as someone maybe having COPD or respiratory or breathing issues that can cause dizziness um, anxiety can cause dizziness so um, typically um, a lot of people with if they get just an anxiety attack or start to get more anxious they also get dizzy with dizzy with that um, those anxiety and dizziness pathways in the brain when really close to each other um, so they um, often that anxiety will trigger dizziness um, neck tension there are, um, and neck uh, disorders there's uh, research out there showing that um, neck injuries can actually um, potentially cause dizziness because of um, damage that happens in the neck and then stress again kind of going along with that anxiety if you're stressed anxious sometimes that's a cause of dizziness so really starting to look at your patterns of dizziness and um, I often would tell my patients to make a little journal when do they feel dizzy? What does that dizziness feel like? How long does it last? Um, what did they do right before the dizziness started? What did they do yesterday that might have caused the dizziness? So starting to really work with your healthcare team and looking for patterns of that dizziness if there's no known cause at this point in time. So some common causes of um, vestibular dizziness in adults. Um, our first one is a nice long name, um, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or BPPV. And you'll sometimes hear this is um, rocks in your ears or crystals in your ears. Um, it's a very common vestibular disorder, and especially in older adults. And we've got crystals in our ear that are supposed to be there. They tell our brain what's going on. Um, and what can happen sometimes is these crystals kind of pop off where they belong. So imagine a, um, a, a bowl of jello, and these crystals are kind of sitting on top of the bowl of jello. So imagine sprinkles on top of a bowl of jello. So those sprinkles are nice and embedded in that jello, they're not going anywhere. Well, all of a sudden, one of those sprinkles pops off. And we don't always know why that happens. Um, there's a lot of research trying to figure out why and we don't always know why um, and all of a sudden that little sprinkle pops off and it goes where it doesn't belong in the in the ear and often when you roll over in bed you look up you bend over that change in head motion causes that little crystal in the inner ear to go into the wrong spot and it causes dizziness so that's one of the um, a common cause for dizziness in older adults um, we have something called Meniere's disease um, with Meniere's disease it's um, You'll have periodic episodes of vertigo that can last for um, an extended period of time. And along with Meniere's disease, people will often have hearing loss, ringing in their ears, and then imbalance as well. And then our last one is vestibular neuritis. And this is just, remember, we talked about that vestibular nerve when we look at that, um, that purple snail on the inner ear, the orange nerve or the yellow nerve coming off of that. If that nerve gets inflamed, and often that can be from a severe cold or just for no reason at all, um, we may get um, dizziness and vertigo, room spinning, imbalance from that, but shouldn't have a change in hearing. So all these disorders are going to have slightly often um, uh, different symptoms that can help us kind of parse out um, potentially what's going on. So we talked a little bit about BPPV. Um, it's often underdiagnosed. So the average person who ends up with a diagnosis of BPPV sees about four to five different physicians and spends $2,000 to arrive at a diagnosis. So often you will see um, when a patient presents to a doctor or an emergency room with um, dizziness, dizziness can be a sign of something serious, such as a bleed in the brain, such as a tumor. Um, so we want to make sure that the, that um, serious diagnosis is not what's going on. So often people will get MRIs, CT scans, blood work, um, all this um, work trying to rule out something more serious um, to help us get to um, this really not serious um, diagnosis of BPPV. Now not to say that BPPV is not potentially serious because if you're dizzy you could potentially fall, you're going to get you know potentially sick and nauseous, um, but it's not in itself is not life-threatening such as a stroke or a tumor. Um, 
what happens often with someone with BPPV is they're often prescribed uh, medications that will actually decrease that vestibular system. Um, and those medications will not help typically in um, a true BPPV diagnosis. So the American Academy of Otolaryngology, which is just your um, uh, ENTs, um, everyone typically knows it as, recommends that actually all adults be screened for BPPV because it's so prevalent and because it can contribute to falls, especially in older adults, if your balance is starting to go anyway. So um, again, it's a recommendation that if you're having dizziness, if you're having balance issues, even without dizziness, that you actually be screened for um, BPPV to see if that's uh, a contributing factor to what might be going on with your balance and falls issue. So we've got our third poll question. This one asks, have you ever experienced vertigo, so room spinning or yourself spinning, um, when getting out of bed or turning your head? And go ahead and answer yes or no for us. Well, this is interesting, Jordan. Uh, well, we, we, we have about 77% of people voted so far, and so far we have 83% who have said yes. They All have right, experienced so. vertigo when turning and getting, or getting out of bed. 17% have said no. So uh, we now have, to have it at 79% and 21%. But obviously a significant proportion of the people on this call have experienced possibly have experienced uh, have, having BPPV or something similar. Yes, so it certainly sounds like it. So certainly something, if that was something in the past that not there anymore, um, good to know. So if it were to happen again, you could hopefully um, get that addressed. Or if it's something you're currently experiencing, make sure you're talking to your doctor. And we'll talk about some other professionals that can also help you with um, dizziness and balance issues. But um, very interesting numbers. All right, so, sorry, moving away from our poll. So why maybe hasn't your doctor looked at your vestibular system? You go in for your, because um, you're having some balance issues, maybe some dizziness, you talk to your doctor, um, he or she refers you on to maybe a specialist, um, gets some blood work, some MRI, some CT scans. Um, general practitioners actually receive very little training in the vestibular system. Um, they get a few lectures on it in school, they know the anatomy of it, um, but it really is a, um, subspecialty within the fields of neurology and the ear, nose, and throat field. So even your um, uh, most ear, nose, and throat doctors aren't necessarily um, subspecialized within uh, the vestibular system. So it's real important when you're seeking out a um, healthcare provider that you're working to try to find someone, especially if this dizziness is ongoing and um, not a lot of things have helped it, trying to find someone who really specializes um, in dizziness within some of these other um, medical fields. And we'll talk about at the end some places you can find those names. So we talked about the vestibular system, um, some of the diagnoses uh, that are common in the vestibular system in older adults. Let's talk about some other reasons older adults and um, anyone falls. And we'll kind of talk about these um, spe more specifically after I go through them. So um, we can have decreased strength and flexibility that potentially causes falls, decreased vision, decreased sensation in your feet, so not being able to feel as well in your feet, slower balance reactions, decreased or changed cognitive functioning, uh, medication side effects, drug interactions, or polypharmacy. We talked about that a little bit before. Chronic health condition, conditions that are not well managed, uh, home safety hazards, and then alcohol is a potential cause. It's going to affect your balance and your inner ear system. So let's talk a little bit more about each of those um, more specifically. So decreased strength and flexibility. This is a big one that I see in my um, older patients that are having more falls or more near falls. Um, we ask about um, our patients, not necessarily just falls, but near falls, because we want to try to um, catch earlier if we can. We don't want to fix someone after they've already fallen several times. We want to try to fix someone before they even have their first fall. So um, if your muscles aren't strong enough and your uh, muscles are not as loose as they need to be, um, that's going to potentially cause a fall. So think of things like um, being able to get up the stairs safely. If your leg muscles aren't strong enough to get up the stairs, you may be using your hands to really pull on that handrail and let's say your hand slips one day. 
well, that could potentially cause a fall. Um, walking correctly, so being able to safely stand on one leg for a brief amount of time when you're walking, or being able to pick up your foot the whole way so it doesn't drag, that can be a muscle um, strength issue. And so if you're not picking up your leg fully and it's dragging on the ground, when there's that small little crack in the sidewalk, that may cause you to lose your balance. Um, we think of flexibility as being really important as well. If I'm standing up and um, let's say I'm in the grocery store line and someone pushes me from behind because they're not paying attention and I start to lose my balance, I need to be able to have my muscles be flexible enough to be able to lean forward to catch myself. If my muscles aren't flexible enough, I may not be able to adapt for that change um, change in my position. So a lot of things that potentially cause strength and flexibility um, to decrease as we age. Um, some people, once they uh, retire, they're not working anymore, they sometimes start leading a more sedentary lifestyle. Um, so they start just hanging around the house more, or they go um, uh, to the golf course maybe still, but instead of playing golf, they um, sit and play cards, and they're not out moving around. Um, what can also happen is if someone has started to fall or they're just not feeling well, they're, they're um, falling into a little bit of depression for whatever reason, they may start to restrict their own activity. So it becomes kind of this vicious cycle that someone has a fall once or a near fall and they say, oh, well, I, I almost fell when I was going to the grocery store. So you know what? I don't want to go to the grocery store anymore because I don't want to fall again or almost fall again. That was scary. It was embarrassing. I didn't, I didn't like it. I almost hurt myself. Um, so they actually stop moving around as much. And when someone stops moving around, you lose lose your strength, you lose your flexibility, and then you become actually more prone to falling again. So it becomes kind of a nasty cycle that we try to really break. Um, and then um, as uh, people age, we might um, become hospitalized more, uh, have uh, surgeries, illness, um, go through episodes of depression or grieving that kind of cause you to um, uh, stay in bed more potentially. So any of those kind of um, events may cause more bed rest if you're um, on bed rest more, you're going to lose your strength and flexibility most likely, and then again, we um, increase your risk of falling with all that. And we're going to talk about some um, things to hopefully address these issues uh, in the later part of the presentation. So decreased vision, as we talked about earlier, if you remember, vision is a key part of our balance system. So any decrease in vision may lead to imbalance or decreased ability to compensate for our balance system difficulties. So if I have an inner ear issue, remember we talked about um, our muscles and our feet are really important and our vision is important and our inner ear is important. If all those three systems aren't working well together, one has to kind of take over. So if I don't have good feeling in my feet, my eyes actually have to take over a little bit more. So what happens if I have not good feeling in my feet and then not good vision? We need that vision to take over sometimes for our other systems that aren't um, as strong as they should be. So um, lots of causes of decreased vision in older adults, normal aging, uh, more than two-thirds of individuals with low vision are over to, um, 65 years old. Um, so you probably see your friends and family and yourself maybe starting to get a stronger prescription, wearing those reading glasses, um, going to the progressives, those kind of things. Um, we can have eye diseases like macular degeneration, glaucoma, cataracts, diabetic retinopathy. So um, again, another... Um, key to really making sure you manage uh, your chronic diseases like diabetes. And we talked a little bit about visual problems that occur during head motion. So we talked about walking where you see that stop sign bouncing. Um, or you go to turn your head quickly and things kind of blur. I've had my patients tell me things look blurry or they don't catch up, like they're kind of behind their head turn. Those kind of visual issues, if you're having those, those may indicate a vestibular disorder. So something worth um, getting looked at pretty closely by a doctor. So decreased proprioception. So proprioception just means that your body can um, feel where you are, where you're standing, what's going on, and are you balanced, and then it can react accordingly. So imagine you're um, walking from your beach house to the beach. So you have to, and you're on the third floor of your beach house. You have to walk down the stairs. Your body has to sense going down those stairs, being able to adjust to the uh, changes of stairs. You're going to get out to your front walk, and now you've changed a little bit. Your stairs are carpeted, so those are kind of squishy. You get out to the walkway that goes out to the beach, and now you're on the street or the sidewalk, and that's pretty firm. Um, so your body has to adjust to that new firm um, ground, and then you get onto the beach, and now we're back to really squishy sand, and now your body's going to have to adjust again. 
So being it, your body has to be able to sense all those changes in the world that's going on to be able to react to what's going on because your body needs to do different things. Um, if they're going down the stairs, if you're walking on a sidewalk, if you're walking on a beach, you have to adjust differently to each of those um, uh, situations. So what we can have is called peripheral neuropathy, and this is just nerve damage, and it typically happens in the feet or legs, but we can have it in, um, in the fingers. That doesn't contribute as much to balance um, as the feet and the legs do. And this peripheral, peripheral neuropathy is a major cause of um, decreased proprioception, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, later on as well. So decreased or changed cognition. So for whatever reason, um, whether it be um, some aging, um, a disease process like a dementia or an Alzheimer's setting in, um, whether it's medication side effects, um, people may get this kind of confusion, brain fog, that brain just doesn't feel as um, alert as it once was. We talked about even vestibular uh, disorders causing kind of this brain fog. So having a lack of attention or a decreased ability to focus on tasks can lead to falls. If you're um, walking through the kitchen and your brain is just muddy and you don't pay attention to the fact that your dog is laying in the middle of the floor in the kitchen, you may trip over your dog. Um, so those kind of um, issues may come up. Dementia may just um, result in poor safety awareness. The brain just can no longer um, process what's safe and what's not safe, so the brain acts a little more on just kind of impulsivity. Um, and then many um, older adults, um, even if they might need an assistive device, so when we say assistive device, we, need a, we mean a walker, a cane, a wheelchair. Um, if someone doesn't realize that they're unsafe with their walking, they may not use an assistive device, which, which might uh, prevent them from falling. And then there are some um, medications that are used to actually treat dizziness, because there are certain causes of dizziness that you do potentially need medications for, but the, um, sometimes use of these medications may actually cause or exacerbate dementia because of their chemical makeup. So we talked about our balance system, we talked about our vestibular system, we talked about the reasons for falling. Here's our, our big take home message, is falling is not a normal part of aging. Um, you know, I hear lots of patients say, well, I'm just getting older and people start falling when they get older. We really don't, that shouldn't be a normal part of aging. You should um, be able to age gracefully and not be falling and not be in the hospital with a broken hip because you fell. Um, so lots of things you can do to help um, try to prevent falls. We can't say we can necessarily stop them, but we're going to do all we can do to try to um, prevent them. So um, we'll start talking about some things we can do. So we can be screened for our risk of falls. So you may notice that um, within the last few years, um, more recently, when you go into the um, doctor's office, often when the nurse or the person who's doing your intake is talking to you, you're asking your questions, they should, a lot of them are now asking, have you recently fallen? So we're starting as a society to realize that falling needs to be addressed and needs to be looked at and needs to be talked about because falling, most falls are preventable. Um, and again, it's not a normal part of aging. Just because you're getting older does not mean that it's okay that you're falling. Um, so the American uh, Geriatric Society recommends that all healthcare providers ask older adults once a year if they have fallen or are having dis difficulties with their balance or walking. Um, because hopefully, if your doctor, you go in for your yearly checkup and your doctor says, so have you fallen in the last year? You say no, but you know, I'm really feeling more off balance than I ever used to. Hopefully we can get that addressed then as opposed to a year later when you actually do have a fall. Um, so those who perform folly, uh, poorly on a fall risk screen, and there's lots of different versions out there, um, they can be complex, they can be easy, um, or if you really feel you're just not balanced, um, you know you best. So even if your family says, I don't know what you're talking about, you look fine, you don't look off balance, if you don't feel like you're as balanced as you used to be, talk to your doctor, get into um, um, some interventions that may help you feel more balanced and more confident with your moving around. Um, so um, that's what's really important um, into uh, our fall prevention. So our uh, fourth poll question is, have you ever had a fall risk evaluation? And that can be something um, you know, simple from your doctor asking to a more um, comprehensive fall risk evaluation from a therapist or a doctor or a community screening. There's all sorts of versions out there. 
Jordan, I'm going to ask everybody to raise their hand for this. We don't have this poll question programmed in. So if you have had a fall risk evaluation, um, can you uh, go ahead? There should be a, a part under uh, attendees where you can raise your hand. Does everyone see that? It looks like a hand. Go ahead and just raise your hand if it's a yes, you have had a fall risk evaluation. And I'll kind of take a general sense of that. Looks like looks like about 10 people, 10 people that have uh, responded. Um, I'm going to say, well, quick count. I'm going to say about a third of uh, our uh, attendees have say that they have had a fall risk evaluation, which means that um, two thirds have not. Right, so we're off, we're off to a good start, but we gotta get um, some more people evaluated. So the nice thing about um, um, these electronic medical record systems too is these kind of questions are now built into a system for someone to ask. So hopefully more people are gonna start getting screened. And if you're some of those two thirds that haven't had a fall risk evaluation and you really feel like you have either had a fall, um, one or two or multiple, or you haven't had a fall, but you're nervous that you will, again, talk to your doctor, talk to someone on your healthcare team about getting that assessed a little bit more carefully and getting a specified uh, program for you to feel like you're not going to fall. So lots of things we can do to help um, reduce our risk of falling. So three major categories, making sure your health is managed, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. that. Making sure your home and environment are safe. Um, a lot of falls happen in the home. Um, so really making sure that um, your home is a safe place to be. You can only control the outside environment so much, um, but you can control your home environment. Um, and then we're also gonna talk a little bit about um, optimizing your balance and your mobility to help reduce your risk of falls. So medical management, um, managing your chronic health conditions. So we talked a little bit about um, things like uh, diabetes that may cause our peripheral neuropathy, blood pressure. So um, if, you, if your blood pressure is poorly managed and you have episodes of really low blood pressure occasionally and you go to stand up and you get dizzy and you start to walk and then you cause a fall, with that medical condition has caused your fall. So we really need to be, um, you really need to be making sure that you're working with a doctor, a doctor you trust and that you have a good rapport with and really managing any chronic medical conditions you have. Um, going over with your doctor or your pharmacist um, all your medications and making sure there aren't interactions, making sure um, you're on the best medications for what you should be. And don't forget to include prescription medications, over-the-counter drugs like our, you know, you just your over-the-counter pain relievers, um, any medications that, um, you know, are mail order, vitamins, herbal supplements, everything that you are taking as part of a medic medicine regime um, should be discussed with your doctor or your pharmacy. And my one last big disclaimer here is never, never, never alter your medications without speaking for your um, with your doctor. Um, a lot of medications need to be um, slowly tapered off or um, have worse side effects if you stop taking them at certain times. So um, especially if these are medications that are affecting um, your chronic health conditions, that um, these may be life-saving medications you're on. So really make sure that um, you never make any changes to your medications without talking to your doctor first. Um, and then just making sure you stay appropriately hydrated and um, appropriately nourished. That's all going to just help um, your system function the way that it should. So our home and environmental safety. Um, so if you are at risk of falls, um, consider the possibility of using an assistive device such as a cane or a walker, um, a wheelchair potentially if you're um, severely off balance or sometimes people will use wheelchairs if they've got endurance issues. So let's say around the house when they're rested, they're pretty balanced, they feel fine, but when they're gonna go out to the mall, um, they get really tired easily and the more tired they get, the more off balance they get. So um, using a cane or a walker or wheelchair doesn't have to be a 24 hour um, a day event. It may just be in times where you're fatigued or you had a bad day yesterday or whatever. If you're thinking of using an assistive device or you think it may um, help you, I would highly recommend um, speaking with someone trained in how to use assistive devices. So that could potentially be your doctor if they're comfortable in that or um, a physical therapist. Um, because you want to make sure that you're using that assistive device correctly. Um, an assistive device used wrong is uh, potentially not going to help you at all or potentially be more of a fall risk if it's used incorrectly. So if you do choose to use something like that, make sure you're using it correctly. 
uh, make sure you've got clutter-free walkways throughout your house, um, increased lighting. I've told a lot of my patients to um, get night lights, and you can get night lights that are motion activated, so that especially if you're sensitive to light at night, um, you can, um, you know, as soon as you kind of sit up on your edge of your bed, that your night light can turn on. Um, so remember we talked about, again, we're gonna go back to our eyes, that if our eyes can't give us input into the world, we're more off balance. So think about if you wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and you're kind of groggy, you're, you're tired because it's the middle of the night, so already you're not in your most balanced condition, and now it's pitch black in your room, you can't see a thing, well now your brain has no vision to help you with your balance, so you're at a higher risk of, of falls. Um, so light is really, really important um, to help. You know, think about things like stairways going down to your basement where it's maybe dark. Get a good light in there so you can really see what you're doing. Um, reduce glare um, so that you're not getting mixed uh, visual signals. Um, we talk, just talked about light switches, so make sure there's a light switch at the top and the bottom of the stairs if you can, so that you don't have to wait till you get to the bottom of the stairs to turn that light on. Uh, putting in grab bars and handrails, either um, in your bathroom if you need to, getting in and out of your shower to help get off of your toilet, um, or handrails throughout the house. I've had patients, um, especially with maybe more chronic um, condition, that have installed handrails throughout their house, so they've always got something there to help with their balance. Uh, make sure you don't have any safety hazards, such as broken steps or loose carpeting. Um, really look at things like throw rugs and make sure those are really secured down. You don't want to be tripping over the corner of a throw rug. And if your balance just isn't what it used to be, um, I often tell my patients, everyone trips. I trip all the time, your foot catches. It's being able to recover your balance that's the important part. So um, if um, someone with um, stronger balance trips on your carpet in your house, they might be able to recover their balance. But if your balance has been a little bit affected and you trip on that same carpet, that may lead to a fall or to a near fall. So really making sure that you um, fix any hazards that may lead to a trip or a fall. Um, thinking about raised toilet seats. To there are some toilet seats out there that are really low. And if you've got some decreased strength and decreased flexibility and you have to really push yourself to get off of that toilet, that may lead to a fall. So thinking of a raised toilet seat, there's all sorts of different products out there, um, or a grab bar or something beside the toilet to help you. And then thinking about a shower chair, if balance um, is hard for you right now, being able to sit down in the shower is going to be a lot safer with a slippery floor and soap and all that. Um, thinking about a handheld shower so that you can remain seated for most of your shower and you don't have to worry about standing and sitting and potentially losing your balance. And then also thinking about a non-skid um, surface in your um, shower. All those are things that are going to really lead to hopefully a safer home environment for you. So our balance and mobility. Um, if there's one thing that you can do to help reduce your risk of falls, exercise, exercise, exercise. Um, again, nowadays there's all sorts of great programs out there. So um, Check your, um, if you're over 65 or whatever the age cutoff is in your local area, check uh, senior centers. Often senior centers have great exercise programs. Um, check even at, um, sometimes um, assisted living facilities will have exercise programs that are open to the community. Um, check out your community gyms. So, um, you know, we have um, in our area county gyms that are, you know, owned by the county. So look at their schedule of programs. They may have um, balance-specific exercise programs or they may have exercise programs that are aimed at, aimed at older adults. So looking at those. And then also looking at potentially um, physical therapy uh, to really help um, address your balance issues. If you and your doctor think that would be um, helpful, the benefit of physical therapy is that um, we as physical therapists can see you on a one-on-one -on -one basis, really develop a personalized exercise program for you, um, and really look specifically at what you really need to help um, get your balance back and decrease your risk of falling. But any of those options are out there to help you um, really work on your balance and mobility. Jordan, something that uh, we've been hearing uh, a, a lot uh, from some of our uh, members is that they uh, are attending yoga classes that are specifically designed for people with balance issues. Oh, 
Yeah, so that it seems to be a, a new thing that uh, yoga instructors are recognizing that yoga is very helpful for people with balance issues, and so they're they may be they may be called yoga for people with balance issues or people with chronic health problems or just called low impact yoga uh, and uh, and then Tai Chi as well um, I I know that there's been research out there that says that Tai Chi which is a, a form of martial art uh, exercise um, but very slow and and um, fluid movements uh, is very beneficial for the balance so uh, I encourage you guys to check that out as well Yes, wonderful. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, and really, I always um, tell people in general, but my patients as well, um, find something you enjoy doing for exercise. If you enjoy doing Tai Chi and yoga, you're more apt to go and do it. If you do not like Tai Chi at all, but boy, you love that senior exercise class you found at the gym, go do the senior exercise class and, and enjoy it because you want to, um, if you enjoy it, you'll do it more often and you'll get a, a better benefit out of it. Jordan, uh, I, I have a question that uh, I think uh, other people might have as well, and, and that is, what about just going out and taking a walk, you know, walking around your neighborhood, would you consider that a, a good exercise, um, an effective exercise for this purpose? Yes, that's certainly great. Um, movement, movement, movement. Um, and really making sure, now making sure you do it safely. <laughs> so if you're really um, off balance using your assistive device or having someone go walk with you. But yeah, just the more you can move, the better. Um, if you don't have a great neighborhood for walking, um, grab a buddy and go um, to the mall early in the morning and walk around. Um, so yes, walking is a fabulous form of exercise just to get yourself moving and keep yourself strong and maintain your flexibility. Yes, so wonderful, Cynthia, thank you. So some more specific things you can do. So we talked about our vision, so make sure we're managing our visual changes. So get your regular eye exams. And if you do have a health condition, um, I'll use diabetes again as an example, um, that does affect your vision, make sure you're managing that health condition. If your doctor or someone has told you that you need prescription lenses, make sure you're wearing them. Um, they're not going to do you any good um, sitting around the house if you don't have them on. Um, when you go out in the sun, make sure you've got sunglasses on just to protect your eyes. Good eye health for that. Um, there has been research that shows that bifocals and multifocal lenses, while they're lovely and convenient, actually increase a risk of falls because you don't have as good depth perception um, and you're not looking in the right spot to see potential fall hazards. So if you are someone that wears bifocal or multifocal lenses and you do have some balance issues, um, maybe going back in and talking with your eye doctor about going to a single focal lens. Um, and I've recommended that to several patients where they go to a single focal lens, um, for their daily use, and then they've got a pair of reading glasses um, or computer glasses. Um, so it gives you more pairs of glasses, but if that's a little something that can help you reduce your risk of falls, um, definitely work lo worth looking into. And then if you have um, vision changes that are caused by your uh, vestibular disorder, working with a vestibular therapist to help um, uh, fix some of those vision changes. Um, so managing somatosensory changes. So somatosensory is just what your body is feeling. So we talked about that peripheral neuropathy, making sure your feet can feel what you need to feel. Um, so managing diabetes and high blood pressure can help slow the progression of per peripheral neuropathy sometimes, again, our, our nerve damage. Um, like we were just talking about exercises and staying strong and active um, is going to help keep my muscles and my feet and my legs strong so that I can move how I need to, not drag my feet when I walk, and then also react to balance changes when they happen. When that little kid runs into you in the grocery store or um, someone pushes you that you're not expecting or you trip on the crack in the sidewalk, we need to, again, be able to react well to our changes in balance. And then making sure you have proper um, foot care and foot wear, so seeing a podiatrist if you need to for foot care issues. And then making sure you have good supportive shoes. Um, if you're someone with balance issues, you probably shouldn't be wearing things like flip-flops because they don't stay on your feet very well. So making sure you've got good um, footwear that's going to help um, keep you balanced. So addressing our vestibular causes. Again, we talked about vestibular um, uh, symptoms and possible vestibular causes early on in our presentation. So if you are having dizziness, vertigo, or even imbalance without dizziness and vertigo, we really want to figure out why you're having that. Is it a vestibular issue? Is it a strength and balance issue? Is it a vision issue? Is it a medication issue? 
So um, Vestibular Disorders Association has a wonderful online um, directory so people can um, list themselves on this online directory and say, yes, I am a qualified vestibular specialist and I'm happy to see patients with these kind of issues. So uh, Vestibular Disorders Association website um, or their phone number, they have wonderful people in their office that can help you um, track down the right specialist in your area. So um, when you go see that vestibular specialist, um, you may get diagnostic testing, you may get clinical testing, all sorts of paths may be taken um, depending on um, what they think might be going on. That's a little bit outside of what we're talking about today, but lots of different things may happen once you see a vestibular um, specialist. And if you're having um, a lot of times severe dizziness, um, uh, talking to the doctor about a vestibular suppressant medication may be helpful to improve your quality of life. Um, or if um, your system is kind of where it is and we're not going to see maybe a huge improvement um, in the um, immediate future, potentially using medications to help um, address that. And that's, again, something that hopefully a um, vestibular um, a specialist uh, medical doctor would be able to help you with. So we've talked about just managing your overall health, so working with your primary care, looking at your medications, looking at your health conditions, talk, 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 talk about your balance and falls, um, issues, concerns, make them well known. Um, that way you can hopefully get that addressed. So we talked about our lovely provider directory, so make sure to, um, if you feel like it's especially dizziness related, um, making sure you um, find the appropriate provider um, who can really address that for you. So who are these vestibular specialists that are out in the world or might be able to help with some of these things? Um, physical therapists um, are a big group. We talked a little bit about ENTs, um, neurologists. You may, um, an occupational therapist um, may be able to help you and may be specialized in treating uh, vestibular issues. If you're um, having vision issues, going to see a vision specialist. Um, if you're having um, dizziness that's caused by anxiety, stress, um, if um, depression or other mental health issues are preventing you from being active and getting out in the community and um, uh, staying healthy, certainly speaking with a mental health counselor or someone in that realm of medicine. So lots of different people out there um, and certainly trying one of them. And if they um, can't help you, hopefully they can uh, refer you on to the next person who can. So in general, these are kind of more, um, more life uh, things, not necessarily specifically to do with balance, but making sure you enjoy life. Get out and socialize. Um, watch videos that make you laugh, um, make you um, uh, get into a great mood. I could spend hours on YouTube sometimes uh, clicking through different you know, funny cat videos. Um, if you like art or music or any other hobbies that you enjoy, um, make sure you're going out and enjoying them and getting out and using those muscles and working on that balance in a fun way um, and really getting out there and enjoying life. And then along with that, reducing stress or finding support if you need it. So. Um, being able to relax and breathe and um, um, think about being healthy and being balanced. Um, lots of great, again, with the um, advent of the internet, lots of great um, local um, online support groups, um, lots of local support groups for various issues. Um, so find whatever your support system is, use it and find it. Um, and if you don't have local family, find a local support group or an online chat group that you can work with um, to really help you work through some of these issues um, with uh, balance and falling that can be um, very hard to deal with sometimes, especially if it's become um, isolating for you. So find your support system and, and try to use it. Jordan, I just wanted to mention that um, there is a support group directory on the oh, yes. uh, this, on the Vita website as well. So um, go to vestibular.org and and uh, click on uh, help and support at the top, uh, and that'll lead you to the support group directory. And Vita also has a um, well, we have a Facebook page that uh, many people use um, to for support because we provide a lot of uh, um, links to uh, interesting articles. Uh, um, that uh, can be very useful, but also we have a members forum, an online members forum for people who don't have access to a local support group. Sometimes it's very helpful to, um, to talk to other patients online and just hear what their experiences are. Part of it is getting validation for um, that, so that you, you know that you're not alone because oftentimes people's family and friends, they don't understand what you're going through because you look normal. Uh, you know, maybe you don't, you don't look sick, so to speak. Um, 
uh, and also to get tips and tools. Uh, a lot of times um, you can share with other people on the online support group. It's very helpful. So again, just visit the VITA website for more information. And if you have questions, please feel free to contact our customer support, either via email or phone, uh, and, and hopefully we can point you in a direction to um, help you get the resources that you need to, uh, to get help. Wonderful. Thank you, Cynthia. That's excellent. Um, Vestibular Disorders Association, a wonderful group, and they really are there to, um, to help you and find your way to, um, to the right path that you need to help yourself. So lastly, um, kind of like Cynthia was talking about, um, empower yourself by talking to other people, by learning about what's going on in your body. Um, Vestibular Disorders Association has um, lots of educational publications that you can either download or they can, um, I believe, mail to you. Um, and then if you, um, if you are interested and you want to kind of share your story with others. Um, so like Cynthia was talking about, you want to let others know that they're not alone, you're not alone, ever, you know, people are going through this um, along with you. Um, do get in contact with the Vestibular Disorders Association and they have a wonderful um, burgeoning um, vestibular ambassador program. So these are people who are willing to talk about what they've been through, offer um, suggestions, advice, um, um, an ear to just kind of listen to what's going on, um, and this is a wonderful group of people that are really um, there to um, help support you and um, help in your education. So, like we talked about, Vestibular Disorders Association mission is to support, inform, and advocate for the vestibular community. Um, they've got educational resources like we talked about, our professional um, provider directory we've mentioned, our support group uh, network directory, um, both to link you to support groups in your area or the online uh, forum that Cynthia was talking about. So there's all the information for um, Vestibular Disorders Association. They've also got a Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest page. They are all over the place. So um, easy to find them um, and get some more information if you are interested. So I hope that's been um, a helpful presentation for people and um, I guess if there's time for some questions, we can um, I can try to answer some questions. We do have <clears throat> time for some questions. Um, we've uh, we've gone about an hour, but we did allocate some extra time. If people do have questions, um, please type them into your questions pane, and I will uh, kind of summarize the the common threads and and present them to. Um, present them to Jordan here and uh, I'll just take this moment to thank you all again for attending this webinar and uh, on the behalf of the Vestibular Disorders Association we really do appreciate your support as members um, and uh, and I would ask you um, you know webinars are new for us this is the second uh, patient oriented webinar that we have done this year uh, which is um, or ever I should say we do have <laughs> one other webinar coming up uh, in September that will be on concussion uh, so that's geared toward a, a different audience uh, and the the vestibular uh, impacts of concussion um, but we are open to other topics if you uh, have a topic that you um, would like to uh, hear about um, uh, via the webinar uh, process, please feel free to email us um, at info at vestibular.org uh, and uh, we can uh, work on presenting that in the future. Uh, and, and also please feel free to give us feedback on, on this webinar. You know, what can we do to improve our webinars in the future? Um, should we be more general, more specific, that sort of thing? Um, you should be receiving a survey uh, via email after the, the webinar webinar is complete um, and uh, I, I really encourage you to, uh, to give us some feedback. Um, I have a question here. Um, uh, it says, do you know any valuable resources for tailoring physical therapy for patients based on where the vestibular dysfunction is occurring? So does that make sense to you, Jordan? Yes, I think so. <laughs> um, so my first kind of response to that um, is hopefully you're seeing a um, therapist who's experienced in vestibular rehab. Um, a therapist who's experienced in vestibular rehab should be able to kind of work with you um, to figure out, um, based on kind of where your um, diagnosis is coming from, how to address that uh, diagnosis or that location specifically. Um, I'm not sure there's probably good 
general resources out there, um, certainly lots of um, physical therapy textbooks and things like that that'll help um, work through all that. There's a lot of vestibular exercises that are general, um, depend, you know, it's going to apply um, across many um, vestibular um, uh, diagnoses. So I think, not a great answer to that question, um, but I think first thing is to talk with your therapist um, to, if you're working with a therapist currently, um, make sure they've got a little bit more advanced training in um, vestibular or seeing multiple patients with that. And um, really talk to them about um, what you're experiencing, what's helping, what's not helping, how you're feeling after exercises, and those kind of things. So not a great answer to that question, but hopefully that's a little bit of information. And I'll also add to that that we have, uh, Vita has some uh, publications on our website um, about vestibular rehabilitation therapy uh, in our educational resources section and also under in educational resources under other there are a couple of uh, publications about um, vestibular rehab and, and compensation so I encourage you to, to look at those areas um, I have several questions coming in now so I'm going to try to get to a couple of them sure. um, one is can you please comment on balance testing to assist in diagnosing BPPV and better directing vestibular rehab um, so the the classic test for BPPV are these positional tests. So um, taking a patient into a position and seeing if we see what's called a nystagmus, so a, an abnormal movement of the eyes. That's really the classic test to see um, if we've got BPPV going on. Um, what I often did with my patients where I thought that would be um, that's kind of what's going on, is I do those tests first, see if they had the BPPV, um, treat that because that um, can be a very easy treatment. Um, and is actually fairly successful um, within a few number of treatments. And I kind of treat that, and then I would look a little bit more in depth at their balance um, uh, system. So lots of different clinical tests out there to do balance. Um, there are tests um, such as uh, things called the Berg balance test, the um, functional gait assessment, the dynamic gait assessment. Um, there's something called the um, modified clinical test Oh, I'm going to get the acronym wrong. Um, clinical sensor, clinical test of sensory integration on balance. I think I butchered that, but um, all sorts of different ways to look at um, balance in general, and then what part of this balance is not. Um, of part of this balance system is not working. Um, so there are machines that uh, do similar things um, as some of our clinical tests and can give us some different information. So um, I often didn't use balance testing necessarily to diagnose the BPPV, but used it as a secondary to say, okay, we've got the BPPV cleared out, um, so let's see what effect it's had on your balance, because it can have some effect. And I've seen a few patients that by the time they came in to see me, the BPPV had actually kind of cleared by itself, but they still just weren't 100% or just didn't feel good because of this kind of um, um, attack that this BPPV had had on the their vestibular and their balance system. So I often use it as kind of a two-pronged approach. Let's clear the BPPV out, and then let's also look at your balance system and um, use some of these um, clinical tests to figure out, okay, are we actually also having some maybe vision issues that we need to address or some just general balance issues um, that, may, that are maybe underlying, um, or is our vestibular system still just not functioning the way it should and working to really strengthen that vestibular system? So I hope that answers that question a little bit. Great, thank you. And, and I also want to point out, um, uh, again, refer you to the VITA website under Educational Resources. We just updated our uh, publication on diagnostic testing. Oh, so that might be really helpful uh, for you to look at as well. Um, I have one other question here uh, that's a little bit more specific, but I think uh, is interesting. Uh, there's someone who says that they've been They've been treated for MS, but they th believe that they are also having possible separate vestibular issues. But as soon as the doctors hear about the MS, they dismiss any inner ear problems. What can she do to convince them to test her for vestibular issues? Oh, that's interesting. And so um, MS um, can also have a vestibular component. I certainly had... Um, 
uh, patients that had MS that I wasn't really seeing necessarily for vestibular issues, but because of where the lesions were, um, they were maybe sitting in the vestibular components of the brain. So that's certainly one thing to kind of look at with your doctors. Have them look at that MRI with you a little bit. Um, one option may be to, um, if you haven't had physical therapy in the past, um, ask for a prescription to physical therapy and um, use Vita's website or your local resources and find a vestibular therapist. And they might be able to do some more clinical testing um, that helps to diagnose if there's something more going on in that inner ear or do we think this is maybe um, additionally MS related or is it both or is you know MS very separate and we really are having an inner ear issue. Um, so that's a lot of that kind of teasing a vestibular therapist um, is trained to do because that can get complicated um, and I imagine that's very frustrating when they really um, when they dismiss what you are um, what you feel is going on because again I think patients know their bodies the best um, so I'm sure that's very frustrating. Um, the other option is potentially to um, either ask your doctor or neurologist, um, depending on how, um, what kind of relationship you have with them, um, for some um, inner ear testing. So there are specific tests that can look at the function of the inner ear um, and see if the inner ear is functioning the way it should be. Um, and those are tests that would be done more in kind of a laboratory type setting. Um, some physical therapists do them, um, but not many unless they're at like a big research institution. So I don't know, depending on where you live, um, trying to find some of those resources. But often um, one or two ENT practices in an area will have these um, this vestibular testing equipment. So that can be an option too, either um, contacting your doctor um, and asking them for a referral there, depending on how your health insurance works, can get complicated. Um, or just trying to um, scope out, again, either using um, Vita's resources or your local connections and find an ENT um, who does uh, vestibular specific testing and um, you can use that lovely um, uh, information that Cynthia just referenced regarding um, diagnostic testing to get kind of some of those names of the tests and um, that's an option too to really get uh, vestibular specific testing either in a um, PT clinic like we talked about or in a um, uh, ENT type um, um, lab setting to figure out if there's something actually going wrong with that inner ear itself um, so that you can kind of help tease that out with your doctor. So I hope that helps a little bit and hopefully you have some better luck trying to tease that out a little bit. Great. I have um, one other question that's kind of specific, and I'm not sure if you, uh, I'm not sure if uh, this is something you can address. They're asking about balance belts. I know I've, I've heard about balance belts. Uh, I don't believe that they are um, available uh, um, clinically right now, uh, but uh, do, you, do, do you feel like, uh, is that something that you can address? I'm not sure I know balance exactly belts. which ones you're talking about. Are these the ones that vibrate? Right. Or are these the ones? Yeah, okay. I think so. Um, I think these are the ones, and yeah, I can't say I've heard much about them, but I think there's some of these that will, um, and there's lots of different systems they're coming out with that um, has a like an inclinometer in them and I think actually even like um, cell phone apps or maybe they're looking at this where if you start to lose your balance um, the belt will vibrate or your phone vibrates and um, cues you to make a correction earlier rather than later so I don't know if that's what you're referring to um, or not I have to say now I have been out of the clinic for about a year um, I hadn't really seen them much when I was um, practicing, and I can't say I know the current research on them, so I'm not much help on that. Um, but I look forward to, to learning more about them, hopefully, in the near yeah. future. So I'll just say that um, the person who asked the, the question said that they wear a, a King Ma belt, and I'm afraid that we're not specifically familiar with that. Um, yeah. Uh, but there are products out there like that. Um, I don't think that there, uh, I, there's been some research done on them, uh, not a lot. Uh, I don't think right. that the research has been conclusive and it's been done in pretty small studies. So um, we will report on that more um, when there is more information out on, on it. We did have an article in an, uh, a newsletter in 2012. Um, okay. If you, if, if anyone has our newsletters from there, we can we can look that up. But I want to move on because we really only have time for one more question, and this is kind of similar. Someone asked about another device um, that they heard of uh, that goes on the tongue to help with vertigo, and I, I have seen that. Uh, I've seen articles about that research, um, uh, but I don't know a lot about that. Are you familiar with that research at all? I'm not as much either, and I I even just recently been to a vestibular course, and it hadn't um, it didn't come up in the course. No. Um, 
I don't so, think it's very common. I think it's, uh, yeah. it's new research, and I think that the a idea behind it is that there are so many um, nerve endings in the tongue okay, that yeah. um, giving uh, electrical stimulation through the tongue uh, can uh, uh, help to um, connect the, the brain to what is going on um, more quickly. Uh, okay. But um, there are, uh, we have reported on that on our Facebook page. So I, I encourage everyone to um, to uh, follow us on Facebook. I'm going to make a note of both of these belts and the, the tongue, um, tongue stimulation and see if we might be able to report on that more on our website in the news section. Wonderful. So um, with that, I think we're, um, we're at our limit. I want to uh, uh, respect everybody's time. Thank everybody for uh, attending today. Thank you so much, Jordan, for presenting hey, uh, and for helping us put together this presentation. Um, I just want to, uh, again, uh, remind everybody that Jordan is a, um, she is a physical therapist with advanced training in uh, vestibular rehabilitation therapy, and she has donated her time to help us both put together this presentation and to deliver the presentation. So thank you so much. We will have a recording of the presentation that will be uploaded to YouTube soon. So uh, stay, uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, with that, uh, I will say good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh -huh.